30. You would be nuts not to take it. And you're going to see why in just a few seconds, I hope, huh? Just give me, there we go. I just got to move this over here. I'm sorry, guys. Here we go. 2% if they pay in 10 days. Otherwise, they pay the net or the full amount, and then they pay you in 30 days. And if they pay you in 30 days, they cannot take the discount, okay? Now, here's what, I, what I'm trying to say is on my test, when I was teaching in the classroom, I always threw this problem up there, whether or not you should take the discount. With discount terms of 2% 10, a customer saves $2 by paying in just 10 days. So that means this person gave up the money for 20 days, right? They had a choice of paying in 10 or 30 days. So they gave away their money $2. They saved $2. That means that they had a, actually a two over 98 is 2.04%. So that means that they earned 2% in just 20 days. How many days are in a year? 365 divided by what you see there. Oops, sorry. So that means 365 divided by 20 they really earn 37%. Now you're not going to do that calculation or anything, but just have in mind that a 2% discount in 10 days is a very good discount. When I was first working in accounting back in the late 60s, 70s, 2% you might not touch because the interest rates were so high. Here is another contra account, sales, returns, and allowances. You bought some, you bought a bunch of toast, you bought a toaster from, I don't know, Target, and it didn't toast the way you wanted it to toast. So you brought it back, and their policy is they, they take anything back and they issue you a, a refund, or they just take it back. That's a sales return. And allowance might be you brought the toaster back, you paid $40 for it, and you said to the store, I want my money back on this toaster. And the store didn't want it back, and the store says, eh. How about I let you keep it and uh, give you $20 off the price? That might be an example of an allowance. The key thing is contra revenue accounts. That's what's debited. Never debit sales. Never debit sales. And I've got the guitar next to me to punish anybody with the never debit sales song. Okay. So let's talk about sales. Sales revenue, gross sales. Gross is what you build. But now, on our new income statement, it's going to start this way. You're going to have gross sales, sales revenue, less the credit card discounts, less the sales discounts, less the sales returns and allowances. And that's going to give us something called net sales. So take a look at the start of our new um, income statement for the next couple of chapters. Now we get into something, something a little tricky. Measuring and reporting receivables. When you allow customers to purchase merchandise on an open account, the customer promises to pay in the future. Open account means we trust you. We're not gonna, we're not gonna do anything but trust you. We're going to send you the product and we know you're gonna pay in 30 days. We're talking trade receivables here. Trade receivables are amounts owed for credit sales of goods and services. That should really say accounts receivable. That's the same thing. Accounts receivable are trade receivables. Non-trade receivables could be a note. Um, where I used to work, we would sometimes loan employees one for a couple of weeks. That would became an employee receivable. So trade receivables. And we move on here. Now, put your thinking cap on. This is the part of the chapter that can be a little confusing at first, um, but I'll try to make it nice and easy for you as best I can. We have one more account called bad debts expense. Bad debts expense. Guess what? Just because we build a customer, just because we sent an invoice to a customer, Guess what? There's a possibility the guy's never going to pay us. Good 
gosh, does that really happen? Well, yeah, it does. And companies have to deal with it. And there are accounting rules, gap rules that make you handle it a certain way. We're going to go right now. Bad debts um, expense. Question, Brianna? No, I'm just really happy to be learning this because um, this happens in our business a lot, unfortunately. And our CPA has never told us like to do any with them. So they've always been sitting in our accounts receivables. And I'm like, well, that's an, and just this year. I'm thinking, well, that's considered an asset, but we're never going to get paid for those. Those are from, and he's never said anything about moving them. And so this year I, I created this account, but I don't know if I created it correctly. So I'm okay. excited. I'm excited yeah, to learn. It. Yeah. I hope, hopefully this is germane to both of you. Um, yeah. Yeah. And these are, this is the way companies must handle this. Okay. At the end of the month, every month, you have another adjusting journal entry to make. An adjusting journal entry. Look at this, Brianna, Davina. You must estimate the bad debt expense. You must, you must estimate it. You have to sit down at the end of February, in, or, you know, end of February in four weeks, and you're going to look at your receivables or sales, and you have to guess how many of those are bums, how many people are not going to pay you and how much. And here's what we're going to do. Let's start by not having to figure out the number, but now we're given the number. Decker's shoes, right? They looked at their receivables and they say, we think that $4,685,000 will never, never come to us from customers. Keep in mind, at this point, they don't know who. This is $4,685,000 on their aging, like you have, Brianna, but they have to estimate how much these guys are going to stiff them in the future. Bad debt expense is a selling expense closed at the year end, like any other thing, okay? Now look at your journal entry because it introduces two new accounts, including another contra oh we got another contra account bad debt expense credit something called allowance for doubtful accounts and from the xa there it's telling you it's a contra asset account so they sat down and their people estimated we're not going to get paid this much money you know deckers probably has i would guess hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in their receivable so this is a relatively controllable number. Now, this journal entry is always the same. When I say it's always the same, you debit bad debt expense and you credit allowance for doubtful accounts. You will never debit bad debt expense without crediting the allowance and vice versa, okay? The reason I emphasize that is in this part of the chapter, there are only two two-line journal entries that we need to master. And this is the first one. We know, we think that in the future, $4,685,000 will never come our way, okay? So take a look at this now. We said, whenever there is an allowance account, whenever, let me say that more clearly, whenever there is a contra account, whether it's a contra asset, contra revenue, contra whatever it is always married to somebody and they get netted together okay so we have accounts receivable of 100 million dollars making up the number less the balance in the allowance account maybe it's 10 million dollars the difference is called net receivables net realizable value this is the amount of your aging that you realistically think you're gonna collect, okay? Accounts receivable, less the allowance for doubtful accounts is net receivables, net receivables. Now, what happens when we know who the bad partner is? What happens when we actually know who's not gonna pay us? When it becomes clear that a specific account received will be uncollectible, the amount should be taken out of the AR 
and charge to the allowance account. That credit that we set up as the contra asset account is going to be debited and the credit will always be the same. It's going to be accounts receivable. So let's take a look at this. If you, if you guys in the class can get this little part of the chapter under control, it's, 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 a, it's a big help, okay? Well, Becker had actual write-offs of 6969. They wrote off almost $7 million. Let's pretend this is just one company. Brianna, this is one of your receivables, I bet, out there. $6,969,000, okay? I wish. <laughs> and you're hoping to get paid, and you've been calling this person. And then you pick up the newspaper one day, and you see that it was my company, and you see me being led into jail in handcuffs. And the headline says, great financial frauds, Magula is broke. At that point, you know you're not going to collect any money from me. That's the point where you write me off, a write-off. And the write-off is always a debit to allowance for doubtful accounts and a credit to accounts receivable. Think of the allowance as an allowance mom might give you when you were a kid. This is an allowance that you set up, but the company says you can only spend it on reducing accounts receivable. Okay. So let's see what we have in front of us here now. This is a good concept before we get into how we get to the numbers, okay? Notice, I'm going back here for a reason. You look at this journal entry, this write-up, Davina and Brianna, we debit an asset, a contra asset account, and we credit an asset account. They're both asset accounts. It's just that this particular one has a credit balance. So what is the impact on making this entry? Does it change capital? No. Does it change revenues and expenses? No. Liabilities? No. Does it change assets? No. It didn't change anything. And here's how I want to demonstrate it. Before the write-off, well, let's go what they're telling us here. Assume before the write-off, Decker's AR was 62640 and the allowance was 13069 So here we go. They're presenting that here. This might have been as on the 15th of the month, okay? Point in time. So their net receivables were 49 million, almost 50 million. Counts receivable minus the allowance. Well, let's go further. Let's see what effect the total write-offs of 6,969 have on these guys. Well, we know we credited accounts receivable so our receivables aging now only has 55 million. We know we used up part of this with a credit for 69.69. Therefore, your net receivables don't change. A write-off does not change anything. It just a it's just a mechanism for removing the bad person when you know who it turns out to be. When you're doing the bad debt expense at the end of the month, that is a one-time adjusting journal entry. You debit bad debt expense, you credit the allowance. That's the only time you do that. You just do it once. Write-offs can happen every day. When I first went to work uh, in an accounting uh, environment, um, they gave me a dummy's job, you know, just to kind of get me broke in there. And every day I had to look at this big aging for the company. And I would go out to say the 120 day column, your aging might be 30 days, 60 days. And our policy was something like, well, if it ages out um, three, four months, we're probably not gonna get collected. And I would write the journal entry to take it off the aging. And that's what we're talking about here. Okay, there are two methods now, two methods for how we come up with the number. How do we estimate the bad debt expense? And one way is the sales method. And I just need another snort here. Oh, that's ugly stuff. Estimating bad debts via credit sales. Credit sales, not cash sales. Cash sales we've already collected. 
So what we're going to do here is we're going to look at what our credit sales were for the month. And we're going to multiply them by a percentage. And that's going to be our journal entry. They had credit sales of 600,000. They think 1% is not collectible. So that would be $6,000, right? 6,000 credit sales times the company percentage. Hey, who wants to tell me what the journal entry is here? Brianna, Davina, you want to try Davina? Get the words. <laughs> <laughs> A little too quick on the draw with that one for, you see this right here? I hear it. That's not the right entry. So I, I screwed up. My bad. I, sh I shouldn't do that. Here's the entry. You debit bad debt expense, okay? You debit bad debt expense and you credit that contra. Now you have impacted things. You've reduced an asset and you've increased an expense. That's why when the write-off comes, there is no impact, okay? Now, just look at this one more time. This is a very easy method, okay? All you do is look at your sales, multiply by 1%, 2%, whatever. Debit, bad debt expense, credit the allowance, and you're done. Very simple method, but it is not a good method. And I don't think many companies use it because it doesn't take into consideration what might have happened to your old receivables. It's only looking at one month and it's just layering on the new allowance. The allowance goes up, up every month by this journal entry. Here is the way it should be done. Should be done. You should do it by kind of reinventing the wheel every month and looking at your receivables, the aging, the aging. That's a list of who owes you money and in what columns. You have that in your business, right, Brianna? Yes. Okay. So we focus on determining uh, how to come up with the allowance for doubtful accounts. This method is a little more complicated and you need to understand the difference. This method does not give you the bad debt expense. What it gives you is the balance that you want in the allowance account at the end of the month. So let me go on here. Each customer's account is aged by breaking down the balance pretty much in 30 day buckets. And here's a, a simple look at an aging, huh? What do we have here? What do we have here? Here's our aging. Well, Aaron owes us 225, Baxter 500. So we have $10,660 of accounts receivable. That $10,660, that is what the balance is in accounts receivable at, we'll say, the end of the month, okay? So let's look at how these are aging out. Aaron owes us two twenty-five, dollars and it's not due. It's pretty much still early. He has one to thirty. It's in the one to thirty day column. That sounds. That's not a problem. Baxter twelve and three, not so much of a problem. But look at Clark. He hasn't paid us. He hasn't paid this bill, and this thing is sixty days past due. It's really ninety days, huh? So he hasn't paid us for ninety days here, hundred and twenty, and then over one twenty. Here is a real problem. You would cut this guy off, right, Brianna? Yes. <laughs> okay. And Zach, he's way out here. So what we're going to do here is we're going to show you the calculation using the AR aging method or the receivables method. We are going to, there's a lot on this plate. Okay. Here's our total aging, 10,660. Well, our experience is items that are in the not yet due column we're pretty much going to collect 99% of that. So we're just going to say, we're only going to lose 35 out of there. But as the aging, as the invoice gets older and older without being paid, your exposure gets greater. So this company's policy is 4%. If it's in the one to 30 day column, 10%, et cetera. Okay. 
you multiply that out and you get 35,102 for a total of 1,200, ah, darn it, got happy fingers, $1,201. Understand that that is not the bad debt expense. That is not the bad debt expense. That is the amount that needs to be in the allowance account at the end of the month. That's your new balance in the allowance account. So you have to go through a little bit of a calculation. They're telling you down on the bottom here that the balance in the allowance account at the month end is 50, right? 50. 50. How much do we want to have in that account at the end of the month? 1201. That's what we computed from this aging analysis. Desired balance, 1201. We already have 50. Our bad debt expense is the difference. You see that subtle difference, uh, everybody? I see you shaking your heads. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Um, let me ask you a, a question, Brianna. Yeah. One company has um, two companies uh, are in a similar business, right? And each of them have sales of, say, a million dollars. And then the next year comes and one company had zero bad debt expense, zero. Nice. Zero. And their business grew from one million to two. The competitor had say 20,000 in bad debt expense. Who do you think might've done better? The one with no bad debt expense or the one that had bad debt expense? Well, you would think the bad one, but you said that it doesn't really affect the income. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. What I'm getting at is if you have no bad debt expense, that might mean that your credit policies are too strict and you're missing out on a lot of potential business. Anybody can sell to IBM. Anybody can send a bill to uh, Microsoft to get paid. My point is your business was a million dollars and you toughened up your credit policy. So you grew the business to 2 million. Your competitor took some risks and suffered $20,000 worth of losses, bad debt expense, but his business grew by 3 million because he brought in a whole much more customers than you. That, that's all I'm saying. Um, you, want, you do want to see some for bigger companies, I'm saying. Yeah, you, to me that- You know what I mean, the little guy. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. You, you, you wouldn't do this. And uh, you would have showed this video to your CPA and straighten her out. No, I'm only, I'm only kidding whoever it is. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Does it make some sense to you, Divana, Divina? Is, did I say that name correctly? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, and it's Davina? Yes. All right, we're rolling. Take a look here. Look at your allowance account. And I'm gonna uh, later on show you a little more uh, of a shortcut here, okay? Aging. The balance in this example was 50. We credited the allowance for 1151. And there's our new balance. Notice that the balance after the adjustment is equal to the estimated aging analysis done earlier. When you credit allowance for doubtful accounts, there is only one possible debit, bad debts expense. Bad debts expense, credit the allowance, okay? So if you're looking at a T account and all you saw was the 50 and the 11 and the 1201. And I asked you, what was your bad debt expense? You would automatically know it's 1151. Because whenever you credit the allowance, you're debiting bad debt expense. And anytime you debit the allowance, the contra asset, you're crediting the father asset, okay? The one it's married to. Aging of accounts receivable times the estimated, that is kind of what we just did, huh? 
I'm going to skip this. This is kind of a waste of time. What they're saying, what they're pointing out here, we had a $50 credit balance, right? And we needed 1201. We came up with um, 1151. Here they're telling you, be careful because you could have a debit balance. That's all. If you had a debit balance, then you would have to come up with, I guess, um, 1251. Okay. So that's the, I think that's the harder part of this chapter, getting these journal entries down. Uh, how do we handle the aging? Which method to use? Okay, now let's look at a few uh, net sales type things, okay? Credit card discounts, sales discounts. Okay. On January 2nd, 2018, Decker's Factory Stores credit sales for sheepskin boots were $3,000. So I go in there, I'm a spiffy dresser. I went in and I spent $3,000 for these sheepskin boots I walk around in. And I proffered my Visa card. And Decker's has a legitimate $3,000 credit to sales here. You see the credit to sales, $3,000. But what's the credit card fee? 3%. That's paid by the seller. So they only received $2,910 in cash. And this should really say cash. Credit cards are cash. I don't care what it said. Credit cards are cash. The reason I put it in AR is that technically it sits there for maybe a day or so, but cash. So the entry is you debit cash, you debit this expense, not expense, don't make that mistake. If you say expense on the test, you're wrong. You debit this contra sales account, and then you get your, what we'll call the gross sales, okay? Contra credit card discounts, credit card fees are a contra revenue account. And again, this is similar to the thinking about uh, whether we should be a little more loose with our credit we just discussed. You know, you see a lot of small businesses around town, little mom and pop shop, and they have a sign, uh, cash only. Well, a small business, um, they don't want to deal with paying uh, this, this 3%. And of course, they're probably losing some business by doing that. But what they gain is peace of mind. <laughs> they, they know at the end of the day, whatever they got in cash is what their business is. Sales discounts. Now, here's a fun one, huh? Remember what we said. 210 net 30, 2% 2 10 net 30 days. You get a discount if you pay, you get a discount of 2% if you pay within 10 days. Otherwise, you have to pay the whole boat at the end of the month, okay? Sales discounts, okay. We don't worry about this until when we get a check in the mail from a customer. So let's see what happened here. Dickers sold me another another pair of boats recently. The credit terms are two percent net thirty, huh? Well, now we got to record the sale, huh? Well, we kind of learned this in chapter two, right? There's the sale. We debit accounts receivable, and we credit sales. Notice. There is no reference in the journal entry to the discount. The discount comes into play when you are paid by the customer. Okay. So I owe Decker $1,000 at this point. And Decker received the appropriate payment from me for the January 6th sale. So that's within 10 days. So they are entitled to take this 2% discount which is $20, 1,000 times 0 0.02. So our journal entry is we're probably, not probably, come on, we know, we're gonna debit cash and debit the sales discount while we credit accounts receivable. So let's look at this for a moment. This customer owed us $1,000, but we let him off the hook for 980 because he took advantage of our generous 37 and a half percent year interest rate the two percent for 20 days so cash went up 980 
sales discounts, that is a contra revenue account. Contra revenue, it reduces revenues, reduces uh, equity. We have to take the whole thousand out of the agent. He doesn't owe us a thousand anymore. He owes a zero. So, uh, that, so that's your journal entry for a sales discount. And you do a couple of these. I don't think these are too onerous. If the customer remits the appropriate amount on the 20th, what entry would Deckers make? Since the customer paid outside of the discount period, he can't take the discount. He can't take the discount. Okay, may I ask you a question about this, Davina? Are you there? Sure. Yeah. Go ahead. You work for you. You work for um, a company, right? And you're collecting mm -hmm. cash, and you get a check in the mail for say a thousand dollars, and the guy and the guy took a uh, two percent discount, and it was a couple days after the deadline. Would you automatically write this journal entry up here? To record that, the the answer is you might, but can you explain why you might not do that at all? Because he missed the deadline period. Yeah, he missed the deadline period. But here, but here's here's what I'm getting at. What if this is a regular customer who buys from you all the time, and he gives you business of thousands of dollars every month? Are you really going to nickel and dime them for the two dollars, twenty dollars you took off? The the answer is probably not. That's what I'm saying. I'm just, okay. just trying to put a kind of a uh, real world uh, halo on this. All I know is if I was a very regular customer, and one day I went on vacation and then paid the bill, took the discount, and they wouldn't let me take the discount, nothing would drive a customer away faster than that. On the other mm -hmm. hand, you don't want people to take advantage of you either. So that, that's sure. just a real judgment call. That's all. Okay. Interesting, right, Davina? Yeah. You bet. <laughs> so, here we go. Sales returns and allowances. Okay. Well, a customer returned five hundred dollars worth of those thousand dollar boots. I guess he returned the left shoe. I'm not sure. They don't tell us, but he returned shoes. The boots originally cost Decker three hundred dollars. That's interesting. So Decker paid $300 from their wholesaler for these boots, and then they sold them to the customer for 500. I guess you would call that a profit huh? of 200, I would. So let's see what happens though, when $500 comes back, when you have to take that $500 sale away, okay? Well, we know we have a Contra account called sales returns and allowances, debit sales returns and allowances, and you credit AR. And this does reduce your revenue. It does impact your income, your stockholders equity, okay? Look at the other half of this though. When you sold those boats, when we sold those boats, we debited cost of goods sold for 300 and we credited merchandise inventory. Now the shoes are coming back. Customer hasn't even opened the box yet. It's good inventory. So we're gonna put it back in our inventory and we credit cost of goods sold, okay? Cost of goods sold. So we looked at a couple of um, contras here, credit card sales, sales discounts and allowances, and this one right here, sales returns and allowances, okay? Eh, this is just a quick one for you. What is cash? Cash are coins and pictures of uh, George Washington on the bills, right? Checks are cash, money orders, bank draft, uh, treasury bills under 30 days, I would say, C certificates of deposit, Credit cards are cash, wire transfers are cash, direct deposits are cash. You get the idea. Cash is king, huh? And guess what? Cash is an asset that people like to steal. Who knew? And thus it is an asset you really have to protect, huh? So you must come up with some 
appropriate what are called internal controls. Internal controls are policies and procedures that account for your assets, safeguard or protect them, and thus ensure the accuracy of your financial statements, okay? Cash is the item most susceptible to theft and fraud. So we're gonna talk about um, a couple of internal controls, including the bank reconciliation. One of the most important controls, best controls is separation of duties. You don't want the person, we don't want Brianna to be the person who opens the mail. We don't want her to be the person who also enters this into the accounting system. We don't want her to have custody of the money. We don't want her to have custody of the computer system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. She should not be the one to authorize. The more people, the more people you bring into the process, the less likely there is for theft. And I tell this story every semester because it happened in Santa Barbara and I thought it was very interesting and very germane to this. Santa Barbara hired a, a woman, oh, 30 years ago out of Santa Barbara High School. And she went to work as a clerk and she went to college, you know, at night and got her degree. And she had a nice career going. She rose from a clerk to an accounting person. And then she was a, like a accounting manager, I guess. Trustworthy, never a problem. And they called her in one day and they said, Mary, um, we're streamlining. We want you to take over all the duties in regard to parking fines, parking fees. So that meant that the cash came in directly to Mary. Mary is the one responsible for entering it into their computer system. Mary is the one responsible for collecting it. And Mary, as honest as she was, saw an opportunity to steal. Because no duties were segregated, she would take some of the parking fines that you get for $40 down on the beach here, you would mail in your $40 to Santa Barbara Police Department and she would get your check. And then she would go into the computer system because she had that duty and she would delete your ticket like it never happened. And then she put the 40 bucks into her bank account. And this went on for quite a long time until somebody finally realized something was going on. She, she's been in jail for a long time, this poor lady. Um, she took million dollar plus from the police department. So segregate the duties, okay? Now we're coming to the most important in, in the opinion of many control of cash, the bank reconciliation. And you just got to practice this, do, a, do them a few times, get the, get the flow of what we're trying to do here, okay? Bank reconciliation. That is an important one. And they're just showing you some other um, different ways to control cash. Daily deposits. If you work in a fast, if you ever worked in a fast food restaurant or, or any kind of, um, I guess, small retail type place, they don't let the, the cash build up over a week. They don't have seven days worth of cash receipts building up and they say, okay, Bob, take this to the bank right now. No, that's setting themselves up for theft. They make those deposits daily and they do it in a, in a controlled way. No checks go out without approval. Nothing can be bought without approval. Maybe two people sign the checks. These are different internal controls. Now here's the accounting group right here, okay? Here is the start of your bank reconciliation. At the end of the month, your bank account says you have $6,000. But when you got the bank statement a few days later and you look at your balance at the, for the same moment, the bank only has $1,000. Is that a problem? Probably not. The balance per your general ledger is exactly at 12-31-2020. There are things that are still in deposit to the bank the bank doesn't know about. The bank doesn't know checks that you've written and have still not arrived at the bank. 
And let me try to say this a little more clearly. So here's the template for your bank reconciliation. You're going to take the balance per bank. Let's start with the bank side because this is super easy. You're going to take the balance per the bank and put it up in this grid here. You're going to add the deposits in transit and subtract outstanding checks. A deposit in transit is a check you received from a customer. And you mailed it to the bank on the end of, at the end of the month. And the bank didn't know this check was on their way. So when you look at the, the bank statement, it's not, it's not there. So you have to add it to this number. These are called reconciling items. An outstanding check is a check that we wrote, the company wrote, that the bank doesn't have yet. For example, um, I, I work in, at your company. And um, one day I went out to lunch and I, I turned it into the, the business to get reimbursed because it was a business lunch. And it came to $25. I got a check for $25 and I put it in my wallet and I forgot about it for about a month. It was just sitting in my wallet. Well, that check is not in the bank statement yet because it's outstanding, okay? And then we'll add or plus in bank errors I guarantee on the test, you will not have to deal with bank errors. In the real world, we make the mistakes, okay? Not the bank. Not impossible, not impossible. But my point is, if you just have this little mem memorization going, balance per bank plus checks, deposits and transit let minus outstanding checks gives you an adjusted balance. This side here, the bank side, no journal entries. Whatever you see on the bank side, you don't have to do anything with in terms of journal entries. Now, on the ledger side, the balance per the ledger, the balance per the books, the balance per your checkbook, we are now going to look at the bank statement and find things that the bank knows that we didn't know. Well, we looked at the bank statement. Hey, look at this. Somebody sent in a payment of $1,000 directly to the bank. They didn't pay us. They put it in our bank for us. Isn't that lovely? Okay. The bank might have service charges. It might depend. It might be the same every month. It might depend on our activity, our balance. We might make mistakes. We make mistakes. We, we enter a number incorrectly. We wrote a check for $279, but when we entered it into our system, we put 297. So those kinds of things. NSF check. What's that, Brianne? I bet you know what that is, no? Mm, not off the top. <laughs> no. Non-sufficient funds. Oh. It's a bounce check. A okay. bounce check. That's a check we got from a customer and we added the $500 into our checkbook. Now the bank is telling us that the check was no good and now we have to take it out of our balance, okay? All reconciling items on the book side require adjusting entries, not the bank side. Where I worked for many, many years, my accounting manager was a wonderful uh, Asian woman, Nancy, dear, dear, dear friend, I miss her so much. She loved to do the bank reconciliations. It, it was like the greatest joy in her life. And she would get furious every year when the um, auditors would come in, the internal and external auditors, and they would write us up because Nancy did the, the bank reconciliation too much. They said that's a bad procedure. But uh, my point, I guess, is some people like to do these. These are kind of fun, maybe. We'll see. So here, let's look at our first bank reconciliation as we wind this, this uh, afternoon down. Prepare a reconciliation statement for Simmons Company. The July 31st bank statement had a balance of 9610. Simmons only had 7430. Okay, well, we know we have a difference and we're pretty sure that difference is due to timing. Timing, things are in the mail. So this is just a quick look at a bank reconciliation. Huh? They're giving us some information. They're telling us the outstanding checks. They're giving us that number, 2417. And there's a $500 check mailed to the bank for deposit that hasn't gotten to the bank yet. 
So we have to add that $500 direct deposit and subtract the outstanding checks. So let's take a look at the bank side. Look at the bank side, as simple as this. The beginning balance, not the beginning, but the balance for the bank statement was 500. We add the deposits in transit, 500, and we subtract the outstanding checks. That 486, the bank made an error. Yeah, right. So let's see what the bank error was. It's on the bottom. A $486 deposit by the Acme company was erroneously credited to our account by the bank. We looked, we looked at the bank statement and we saw a, a deposit of $486 and we had no idea what it was. Turns out it was a bank mistake. So that's where we get that 486, but you're not gonna have to worry about that. So beginning bank balance, let me say that more properly, balance for the bank statement, plus deposits in transit, minus outstanding checks, Boom, you're done with half of this thing, okay? So let's back up and see what else they tell us. Oh, look at this. We got a bounce check. The bank returned the customer's NSF check, the 225. We didn't know that until we looked at the bank statement. The bank gave us $30 of interest. And look at now, we made a mistake. Now, these are the mistakes <laughs> that we can be made. Check number 781 for supplies cleared the bank for 268. But somehow, some way, we put it into our general ledger at 240. How that could happen, I don't know. Someone, someone had a check right in front of them for $268. And then when they typed it in, they put in 240. So it's a $28 difference. So we got three things. We got the 225, the 30, and the 28. So let's take this a step further. Look at your bank statement now. When we finished with the bank side, we had an adjusting or corrected cash balance of 7207. Our balance at the end of the month on our ledger was 7430, but we didn't know we had $30 worth of interest sitting on the bank statement. We didn't know that some bum gave us a bad check, and we didn't realize that we wrote a check for 268 that we thought was for 240. And that's the whole template. I would say on, a on the test, you you're not gonna have to do an entire bank reconciliation. If you're in the if you were in my class in the classroom, that'd be a different story. But have this template in front of you all the time because this is a very helpful tool to organize it. This is your bank reconciliation. Okay, here's a question. What if at the end of the month, our balance came out to be 7,207, but the bank balance turned out to be $5? That would indicate a real problem, wouldn't it? That would indicate massive theft. And you would look at that and they, and you you know, you look at that for the first time and you say, well, that can't be right. That can't be right. Um, uh, who, who, who was handling the cash this month? They said Davina was. And they say, oh, okay, she's good. Uh, call Davina and I'm sure there's an explanation. And then you find out that uh, Davina's on vacation in Morocco. <laughs> Davina's gone with the money, in other words. So, the bank reconciliation, if it doesn't balance, you got a big, big problem. And now remember we said journal entries are needed for the, for the book side. So this is interest income. We're gonna credit interest income. This is a recording error. They said they bought supplies. This is a bounce check from a customer. So here are our journal entries. And I wish they did the, the journal entries uh, separately, three, but that's okay. Okay, we found out from the bank statement we have $30 more cash than we thought. Interest, debit cash, credit, interest revenue. That bounce check came in, darn it. So that check says we have $225 less in cash. And now we're debiting accounts receivable. 
The reason is when we got the money, we credited accounts receivable, right? Now we find out that this guy still owes us 225. So he goes back up on the aging in AR and we recognize the loss of $225. And here, this check, uh, this was just a mistake on our part. So we have to credit uh, another 28 in cash and debit this expense or this asset we purchased, okay? Only on the company side do you have to write journal entries. In about a week, you are going to be given an assignment called an FSA, Financial Statement Analysis. And it's, it's gonna consist of various metrics. And I'm just gonna go over this one here um, because you're gonna be doing this anyway uh, fairly soon. The receivables turnover, let's talk about this. Receivables, you ever heard that expression? We're turning the inventory over. We're losing money with every sale, but we're turning things over. This ratio tells us, excuse me, how many times you collected the average accounts receivable. So we start by looking at the receivables at the end of last year and at the end of this year, 72 and 108. So we're gonna get, I'm sorry, we're gonna get that average. We get the average, whatever it is. Ah, I'm so sorry, guys. We get that average and we divide it into the receivables. So the turnover is 7.6. Okay, Decker's is 7.6. So is Timberland, Timberland, and so is Skechers. It's a turnover. If you go into a meeting at the end of the month and, uh, the, and you say to the boss, boss, I, I, I want to report that our receivables turnover was 7.6. The boss is probably going to look at you like you're speaking a foreign language. Turnovers. He might say, What's, what do you mean turnover? And you start saying, you start babbling, well, it's the number of times we collected the average receivables. That's not very clear to the layman. So here is the next important step. We're going to turn it into days. Anybody understands days. We know there are 365 days in a year. Well, if we divide that by the turnover, we're going to get the days. So this company collects cash in 48 days. From the time they record the sale to the time they receive the cash, it takes 48 days. That people can understand, okay? And I think now they're telling us we're supposed to go out for, for a sale. Um, what do you think, Davina? any questions? No, I think you explained it really well. Okay, uh, thank you. This will be up uh, by the end of this evening in um, Canvas, and it's on my stupid um, YouTube channel, Bob Smogula YouTube. I put these things up there temporarily and take them down, uh, you know, at the end of the semester. So there's, there's two mm -hmm. ways to access this if you want to look at it again. How are you doing in this class? You like this course, Davina? I do, but it's it's a lot of information to learn. Yes. I'm going to ask you one more question, Davina. Did you take Accounting 110? Yes. Okay. So you're pretty good with the debits and credits, right? <laughs> yeah. Although it was like four years ago. But okay. I, understand, I understand the debits and credits well. Okay. So you can see that's a big step in the right direction, huh? Yeah. All right. Uh, Brianna, what are your thoughts? It is a lot. <laughs> Say what? I think it's a lot of information and accounts, and I'm thankful for QuickBooks, but understanding it's important. So I'm yeah, trying. Yeah. yeah, this this is I, yeah the the hard part in this uh, chapter, I think, is the uh, bad debt expense. That can be a little confusing until you understand. You only write bad debt expense once. And the write-offs are a totally different world, okay? Yeah. All right. Well, All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, so um, maybe we'll see you both on Friday, okay? Okay, thank you. Uh, you take care now. Bye-bye. You too. Bye. I know what, what we can do around this thing that has water on it.
All right, I can't hear anything, but I will see you on Friday. Thank you. Bye-bye, Bianca. Oh,